Okay, so I'd like to start today by asking you to take <laughs> a very careful look at this picture, and I'd like you to do me the favor of raising your hand if you can recognize the movie that this picture comes from. All right, Princess Bride, right? <laughs> so of course, The Princess Bride is um, a romantic fairy tale, and it's about um, Wesley, the guy in black here, and his beloved buttercup, the young lady that's blindfolded, and the adventures that they go through trying to evade Prince Humperdinck, the evil Prince Humperdinck, who is trying to strong arm buttercup into marrying him. And I want to show you a particular clip from this movie, and first I need to set it up just to make sure, for those of you who have seen the movie, that you remember this scene, and for those of you who haven't, you'll know what's going on. Okay, so the guy that's pointing here is Vinzini. He is an outlaw, secretly employed by evil Prince Humperdinck, and he has kidnapped Buttercup. And Wesley, the man in black, is trying to rescue her. And the way that he does this is by proposing to Vinzini that they engage in a battle of the wits in which Wesley puts poison into one of two goblets, and then Vinzini has to guess which of two goblets the poison has gone into. So let's watch. Where is the poison? The battle of wits has begun. It ends when you decide and we both drink and find out who is right and who is dead. But it's so simple. All I have to do is divine from what I know of you are you the sort of man who would put the poison into his own goblet or his enemies? Now, a clever man would put the poison into his own goblet because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. I'm not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you must have known I was not a great fool. You would have counted on it, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. <laughs> Wait till I get going! Where was I? You're trying to trick me into giving away something. It won't work. It has worked! You've given everything away! I know where the poison is! Then make your choice. I will! And I choose... What in the world can that be? <laughs> uh, so, of course, this scene is a veritable treasure trove, right, for the theory of mind enthusiast. <laughs> It so beautifully illustrates the rich mental state inferences that we make in service of understanding other people's behavior. And what I want to do today is I want to tell you about how infants first enter into this system, and I'm going to be talking about one specific aspect of theory of mind, how infants understand other people's goals and intentions. And that's because understanding goals and intentions is central to theory of mind. In fact, in order to understand this very scene, we have to be able to recognize goals at a big picture level, to understand that Wesley's goal here is to free Buttercup, Vinzini's goal is to keep her captive. And even at a more fine-grained or local level, to understand, for example, that when Vinzini points here in the scene, his intent is to distract Wesley so that he can switch around the goblets. So essentially, I'm going to tell you about a series of studies, and these studies were aimed at addressing two questions, and that is, first, do infants understand goals or intentions? And of course, to preview, the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be here. And the second question is, how do they develop this understanding? And the take-home message that my talk um, will give today is that active experience, the experience that infants have producing actions, reaching for objects, performing more complex action sequences, using tools, provides them with a basis to understand other people's goals and intentions. Now, the first question that you might have is, how in the world would you pose this question to a preverbal infant? And I want to tell you about an ingenious paradigm that was developed in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, by Amanda Woodward at the University of Chicago that um, took up this question with young infants. So this paradigm relies on the following underlying logic. This event that I've depicted here, if I asked any of you in the room to describe the event, you probably would say something like, she wanted the bear, she grabbed the bear. So the idea here is that you would selectively focus on certain aspects of the event, and that is the relation between the actor and her goal object. And that's because you and I, as we see people go about their business in the world, we don't see action as an undifferentiated series of motions through space, but rather as directed towards um, goals, objects, events in the world. So to ask this question of um, infants, what Woodward did is she used um, a paradigm that relies on infants' visual attention, how long they look at things, and on the well-known um, finding that infants tend to show enhanced attention, they look longer to events that are unexpected. So initially, infants saw an event um, just like this, and they saw it repeatedly until they were bored. And then during the test phase of the study, the locations of the objects were switched, and infants saw two new types of test events. In one event, the new goal event, the actor reached for a new goal. Now, to adult eyes, this is the interesting event because the actor's goal has changed. In the other event, the actor maintained her goal, but she reached for the object in a new location. There's a change to the spatiotemporal properties of the event. Now, 
one thing that's important to point out here is both of these new events feature changes from the initial event. But we think the change on the lower left-hand side is important and the other change is unimportant because we see people's actions in terms of their goals and intentions. And what Woodward found is that at six months of age, infants look longer to the new goal event than the same goal event, suggesting that they represent the simple action in the same way as adults. What we found in subsequent work is that infants at three months of age fail to differentiate these events, suggesting that there's an important development that goes on here in terms of infants' understanding of goals and intentions, at least in simple events like this. The next question that we wanted to try to answer is where does this development come from? What's the source of this development? And the first place that we looked is in infants' own actions, their own ability to produce actions. Because we know that between three and six months of age, infants get good at reaching for objects. So if you take a three-month-old infant and you sit down with them on your lap and you present them with some toys on a table, they'll look intently at those toys, they might move their arms around, they might even swipe at the toys, but they're certainly not producing the smooth, well-executed reaches that older infants do. And so our question was whether this experience of being able to reach for objects might help infants to understand other people's reaches. The way that we first attempted to answer this question is we took a group of three and a half month old infants, so of course these infants are pre-reaching, they can't reach for objects on their own, and we brought them into the lab and we had them take part in a reaching intervention. So what we did in this intervention is we put little Velcro mittens on babies. <laughs> Machiavellian scientists, and we presented them with toys with the corresponding side of Velcro. Now what this meant is that initially if you sit a baby down in this circumstance, they're going to look at the toys, they're going to flap their arms around, and eventually they'll make contact with the toys, initially ac accidentally. But after learning that they can make contact, they can move the toys around, what you see is that infants' actions very quickly organize, and they start to produce what look like goal-directed reaches. So they'll look intently at the toy and they'll get their hand on the toy. So our question here was whether, having given infants this experience, this would change how they perceived an action like this, where someone's reaching for an object. We used a variant of the Woodward paradigm to measure this, first showing infants an event like this, and then changing either the goal that she reached for or changing the way in which she achieved the goal. So these are the results from our study, and what they show is how long infants looked at each of those two events, and you can see that following the reaching intervention, infants looked longer when the actor's goal had changed, suggesting that the reaching intervention caused a change in their perception of the event. Just to make sure that that was the case, we tested another group of three and a half month old infants who received the tasks in the reverse order, and these infants failed to differentiate between the events. So these findings suggested to us that having this reaching exper experience was exerting a causal impact on infants' understanding of other people's behavior. So this led us to the following hypothesis. We know that infants in the first two years of life get increasingly good at performing actions. They can reach for objects, and then they can solve simple action sequences like this, pulling a blanket to get an out-of-reach toy. And then after that, they can begin to use tools. And the idea here is that as infants learn to act on the world, this might also shape their understanding of other people's behavior. In one study, we tested this hypothesis by bringing 10-month-olds into the lab, and we gave them a task that looked just like this, a cloth-pulling task where they can pull a cloth to get an out-of-reach toy. Now, at 10 months, some infants are really good at solving the task. You present them with the problem, they quickly pull the cloth and grasp the toy. Other infants are not so good at solving it, so they can't seem to organize their actions towards getting the toy. And then we tested them in a looking time based task where they saw another person use the cloth to get an out of reach toy. And our question here was whether infants could recognize upon acting on the cloth that the actor was using it to achieve the goal of getting the toy. What we found here is that infants who were good at performing this action in their own actions, who could readily pull the cloth to solve the toy, could identify the actor's goal here that it was the toy, whereas infants who were not good at solving the problem could not. So what these findings suggested to us is that active experience is doing something to facilitate infants' understanding of goals and intentions. And what we wanted to do next was look further to try to sort of further elucidate what was going on um, in terms of the role that active experience plays in infants' goal understanding. So one question that we wanted to ask was whether there might be something unique or special about infants' active experience. So infants not only as they get older have experience acting on the world, they also have experience watching other people act. And indeed, as infants learn to perform different actions, they have correlated visual experience. So when I reach for an object, I not only have the motor experience of reaching, I can also see myself reaching. So we were essentially trying to disentangle these two potential effects. So these are 10-month-old infants shown here. They came into our laboratory and they were placed into one of two groups or conditions. 
Um, the picture on the top shows the baby who's receiving training and practice using the tool to get the out-of-reach toy in their own actions. And we compared these babies to another group who saw a tool use sequence, the training, an adult being trained on how to use the tool to get an out-of-reach toy. And then again, we tested them on a looking-based paradigm that got at their ability to recognize that when they see another person use the tool, they're doing that in service of the goal of obtaining the toy. What we found in these studies was that infants who received training and practice, but not infants who received just observation, appeared to understand or be able to identify the actor's goal. Suggesting that there's something special or unique about acting on the world that infants get over and above just observing other people's actions. The next thing that we wanted to know was whether infants could go beyond recognizing or identifying goals in um, goals that have been completed or enacted, right? So I told you about, for example, infants' ability to perceive the goal of a reaching action that's been completed. Now, as adults, we can, of course, go beyond this because we recognize that mental states aren't synonymous with actions, right? We can recognize you can have a goal and it's, it hasn't been achieved yet. And so if we see a picture like this, we can recognize that this person probably isn't grabbing the tool to pick it up. They're using it in service of the goal of getting the toy. We wanted to know if this was something that infants could do as well. And so in this study, again, we brought in 10-month-old infants. They received either training using the um, cane as a tool to get the toy or a mesh observational session. And then they saw just the first part of this action sequence. So they saw someone grasping the base of the cane. And then we showed them outcome events in which the person was either holding the toy or the cane. So the idea here is that if infants understand that this initial grasp of the cane is directed towards the goal of getting the toy, then the surprising event should be the person holding the cane, even though that was the visible evidence that they were presented with earlier. And what we found was that active experience, again, uniquely, ex helped infants to not only recognize the goal of ongoing actions, but anticipate or predict upcoming goals. Um, in the last behavioral experiment that I'll tell you about today, um, our question was whether infants could recognize the conditions under which goals can be achieved. So if I were to show you um, an action in the top, that's depicted in the top picture here, so this is someone who has used a precision grasp to pick up a bowl and move it across the table. And then in the bottom part of the slide, what you see is now the bowl has been inverted, right? And you're seeing the person either produce the same ha hand grasp she did initially or a whole hand grasp. Now here, you and I would think that the picture on the lower left is unusual, right? Because this person has the goal of moving the object, but now, based on how she's grabbing the object and the fact that it's inverted, she can't enact that goal. What we found in this study is that infants, depending on whether or not they could produce the precision grasp, could then use that information to predict whether or not a person could achieve their goal. So infants who could do the precision grasp thought this lower left-hand picture was the unexpected one. So active experience also helps infants to predict the conditions under which people can achieve goals. So now I've just given you a whole lot of behavioral evidence that active experience plays an important role in infants' goal understanding. And in the final study that I tell you about today, I want to kind of go a step beyond this and start to ask questions about the underlying mechanism here. How is it that active experience facilitates infants' goal understanding? Now, earlier we heard about mirror neurons, right? These are the neurons in monkeys that discharge both when a monkey is acting and when they observe another person act. And we also know that there is an analogous system in human adults, right? An area of brain network, a brain network that activates both during the production of action and the perception of other people's actions. And of course, people have been excited about these findings because they think, hey, this may be um, one of the ways that people understand other people's actions. When they're observing actions, their own motor plans or representations are activated, and those provide some sort of a guide or template for understanding the behavior of others, with some caveats that were raised earlier today. So we wanted to try to get at the neural system underlying infants' action observation. And of course, with infants, you can't do things like single cell recordings because they're invasive, and you can't test them in fMRI because they're squirmy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fortunately, um, researchers had discovered that um, one thing that you can do, both with adults and with infants, is record electrical activity produced by the brain as it propagates to the scalp, right, by placing non-invasive sensors on the scalp. 
And there's a particular brain rhythm called the mu rhythm that appears to reflect or index the human mirror neuron system, or as, as I like to call it, the action observation execution matching system. So this is a rhythm that is um, attenuated, reduced in amplitude, both when individuals act and when they observe other people act. It's um, prominent over sensory motor cortices. And it, the um, mu rhythm suppression is correlated with activation of the structures that are involved in the action observation execution matching system. So our question was whether we could look at this, the suppression of this rhythm in infants and whether it would be present when they observed other people act. And we had an additional question above and beyond that. We wanted to know whether um, mu rhythm suppression would be uniquely present depending on if infants were experienced with the action that they were observing. So in this study, um, we brought 12-month-old infants into the lab. And we tested them in a, a sort of interactive paradigm where on some trials they watched and in some trials they acted. So on trials that they watched, they watched an experimenter um, lift a series of increasingly heavy blocks and the experimenter would do things like, them, like lift them into a bucket or lift them up into a platform. And then infants were given the opportunity to act. Now, this is a skilled lifting task. So at 12 months, some infants are pretty good at this and some infants are not so good at this. And so, of course, in our sample, some of the infants performed this behavior really frequently and they were good at it. And some of the infants performed this behavior less frequently and they weren't very good at it. And we wanted to know whether that had consequences for mu rhythm suppression when they were observing the experimenter lift the block. Okay, so this graph is going to show you um, mu attenuation as a function of infants' lifting status, whether they were infrequent um, lifters or more frequent experienced lifters. And what you can see here is that mu rhythm suppression is uniquely um, present in those infants who are experienced at lifting the block. Now, one other thing that we did in the study is we looked at whether infants' production of other actions during the task would predict mu rhythm suppression. So sometimes infants do things like push the block. But pushing the block was totally unrelated to what we saw during um, infants' observation of other people's actions. So these findings suggested to us that active experience shapes the neural system underlying action observation. So what may be happening during the course of the development, as infants get good at producing actions, they load down motor plans, motor representations, that then help them out, provide a guide or a template when they watch other people's actions. Um, now, I just want to end today by telling you that I've told you a lot about what infants understand about other people's goals and intentions and how they might achieve this understanding, but I want to point out that this is just, of course, one aspect of theory of mind, and um, many people are interested in the question of theory of mind in infancy. So there are labs around the country and around the world that have investigated other aspects of theory of mind. There appears to be evidence for infants' understanding of desires, perceptual states, preferences and dispositions, and perhaps even possessing an implicit understanding of other people's beliefs. Thank you.